Thank you, Baxter, for a beautiful piece. Good morning to all of you, and welcome to worship with First Baptist Church. For those of you joining us here in person and those of you joining us online, we are grateful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Today is uh, the season of Pentecost. As you see, we continue to remember that we are growing in Christ together. The color green reminds us of growth. So as we go through worship today, we'll keep in mind how we are continuing to grow together. I especially welcome our guest here with us today. Thank you for coming and joining with us. If you haven't already received a connection card, I hope you'll fill one out for us. Let us know uh, your contact information so that we can get to know you better during the week. You can also pick up a gift from one of our ushers before you leave today and get to know us better as well. I have a few announcements for us today. Most of these are in your bulletin, but I just want to remind you of a few of them. First, I want to let you know that our maintenance technician, Ted Hatcher, is battling cancer right now. He's been out for some time having had surgery and therapy and chemo and radiation. He has been in rehab for the last few weeks and is coming home soon. But when he comes home, he will need round-the-clock care. He only has one sister who actually does not live here in town, so he will need that care from others. So we are asking you to be generous. And we are gonna collect a love offering for Ted's care. If you could, uh, you can write us a check or drop it uh, in, in the offering plate and just let us know that's what it's for. As we gather that money, we will be able to help his sister pay for his care as he comes home. Ted has kept our church running well for so many years and we are grateful for all he's done. And we want to continue to love him through the ways that we can care for him in these days. I also want to remind you that tonight begins Vacation Bible School. First Baptist has not hosted a Vacation Bible School in a few years, so this is something to jump back into with both feet. We are doing this alongside our sister church, Chatham Heights Baptist. It will be held at Chatham Heights Baptist. We've invited our Early Learning Center families. We've invited um, all of, of course, the church kids. And we hope that if you haven't already signed up to help, but would like to, that you would let us know and we will put you to work. We begin tonight at 4.30. So if you want to show up at 4.30, we will find a place to put you to work. There's help in the kitchen, help with classes. Uh, I'll be teaching missions if somebody wants to come help me do that. We'll be learning from some CBF missionaries. So. It's an exciting time to be a part of kids' lives. Each day we'll meet from 6 to 8.30 over at Chatham Heights. So let us know if you would like to volunteer any night this week. You don't have to do every night. You can do just one night or two nights. We would love to have you to help with this great ministry in our community. We also continue to need some rotating teachers for our Sunday School Hour for Children. We have a couple that are, are doing it on their own, but they would like some help. So if you have ever wanted to help nurture kids' faith, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. We have a small group who love to learn, who have a great time in Sunday School, and whose parents are right down the hall learning together. So if you are able to do that, please let the church office know and we will plug you into that ministry. Last, this is our last week to collect for Undies Sundays, probably the best name missions group that we've had here in a while. And it is gathering items for our school children here in the area. Uh, everything, it's all newly packaged, underwear, t-shirts, bras, socks. They keep these on hands for the kids in need in the school systems. And we are partnering with a number of organizations here who are gathering these. If you haven't brought them yet, uh, you can do that through the end of this week. So you have all week to bring those in, and we will make sure that they get where they need to be. Friends, it is a good day to gather and worship. It is a good day to remind ourselves that we continue to grow in Christ. So now, let us focus our hearts and worship together. You can turn with me to page 638, or you can look in your worship folder and find the words to the first verse of Precious Lord, Take My Hand, standing as you are able. <laughs> Precious 
Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to thy love. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come into your presence this morning with our busy schedules of summer activities, crowding our lives. Our souls need to be fed. And yet, we seem powerless sometimes to find nurture and feeding that sustains us. And this hour, open our ears Open our eyes and our hearts to hear your words of hope and healing for us. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you can turn and page 580, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult might be a tune that you haven't sung these words to before, but it's not hard, okay? Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Psalm 145, verses 10 through 18. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. 
to make known to all the people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson today comes from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Great. I welcome our children to come forward. this morning. All righty. We're going to read a story today about how Jesus fed a lot of people with just a little bit of food. I'm going to show you a picture. This is our children's storybook Bible. This was written by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And it reminds us about how God talks about the kingdom of God. Jesus is always preaching about it, but he calls it God's dream. So this is Jesus feeds the crowd. Do you see the crowd? See all the people? See the bread and some fish? So all day in the hot sun, thousands of people sat and listened to Jesus talk about God's dream. They were so hungry to know God that apparently they forgot to eat lunch. When the sun started to go down, Philip said, Master, 
It's late. The people are hungry. You should just send them home. But Jesus said, why send them home? Let's feed them. Feed them, Philip said. We don't have any food. Well, someone has something to share, Jesus said. And a little boy offered to share five small loaves of bread and two tiny fish. And Philip threw his arms in the air and he said, that's not enough for all these people. Jesus said, ask the people to sit down. He took the bread in his hands, looked up to heaven and prayed over it. And he did the same with the fish. Then he told the disciples to hand out the food and they were amazed. There was not only enough food for everyone, there was more food than anyone could eat. They had 12 baskets of food left over when everyone was finished. So with God's love, five loaves and two small fish fed more than 5,000 people. This teaches us a little bit about what it means to share. That little boy gave his last little five loaves and two fish. That might have been his lunch for the day. Five loaves and two fish. And it fed all of those people. So we remember that God tells us we should share, right? We should give what we have so that other people have what they need, right? Do you guys share? Sometimes we share, yeah? Thank you. All right, well, let's say a prayer to God about how we can share with others. Let's put our hands together and we're going to talk to God. Ready? Dear God, help us to share so that there will always be enough for everybody. Amen. 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 All right, I think Miss Becky has some music for us. Do you guys want to sing? Can we stand up? Okay, let's stand up. It's so hard. <laughs> Baxter, I'm just going to let you play instead of me trying to. Does that work? Let, let's do deep and wide. On your feet, guys. And hey, you guys got to help us with this. Can you do it? That's right. You tell them. She's going to be a minister of music. There it is. Ready? All right, we get our, get our hands ready. Ready? Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. When it flows deep and wide, it flows wide and deep. You ready? Oh. Wide and deep, wide and deep, there's a fountain the story that gave away his lunch was truly letting his little light shine. How about that one, Dad? Okay, everybody find your light. You got your light up? Get your light up.
go to Children's Church? Come on. Yeah. yeah. Get your little there we go. There we go. Good job. Always grateful to Baxter who can bring a little beat to our step for our children. And thank you, Becky, for leading us. Uh, our children remind us that loving Jesus isn't at all boring. <laughs> In these odd days, we have given our offerings in many different ways. I mention it most weeks, but the reality is sometimes our offering plates look different. We haven't passed them in a while. They've been sitting in the front. We drop off our offerings. A lot of us got in the habit of mailing them in. We might give online now. But the result is the same. God takes what we have. God blesses it as Jesus blessed those five loaves and two fishes. And guess what? It multiplies and it grows. So whether your offering is money or donations or time, God is going to do something amazing with it. So let's pray over our offering and present it. Merciful God, the gifts we bring are so small in comparison to the vast needs of this world. Nowhere near enough to save the thousands dying of starvation around the world, or even to meet the needs of all of the hungry and homeless here in our community. And yet, we've brought what we can. And we believe that you can work miracles. As you once multiplied the five small loaves and two fish, multiply these gifts as well today. So that once again, the hungry and the hopeless may receive all that they need and more. Amen.
Well, if that doesn't center us as we move into scripture, I don't know what will. They will know us by our love. And a beautiful arrangement played so very beautifully by the two of you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Baxter. Well, as you already heard with our children, as you already heard as Judy read our gospel lesson, today's lesson is about the feeding of a large crowd of about 5,000 people. And it's an extremely powerful story for many reasons. It's one of the only stories that makes it into all four gospels. So it was pretty important to those earliest Christians. This miracle really meant something. So let's set the scene. Jesus is becoming more famous as he heals the sick. Even when he heads up to a mountain to sit down, large crowds follow him. And at this time, the religious holiday of Passover is close by. So lots of people are getting ready to celebrate. Then in verse 6, we read that Jesus is about to set up this whole miracle. As if he's about to show the disciples what's actually possible. And he says, where are we to buy bread for all of these people to eat? I was reading a minister write about this passage, and she joked that if Jesus posed this test in a contemporary church, one might expect the trustees to echo Philip's money management concern pointing out that the congregation doesn't take in enough revenue to support such a project. The outreach committee might reinforce Andrew's position, stating that the congregation has only earmarked a small percentage of its income for missions giving, and, well, this proposed project's needs far exceed the allocated amount. The groups for discipleship and worship might not even have an opinion at the time because they're too busy preparing for that fast-approaching religious festival that's coming up. The Building and Grounds Committee may assist with seating everyone on the lawn, although some members might worry about the effects of this event on the property's landscaping. Sometimes those of us who have grown up in the institutional part of church forget that miracles come about in unexpected ways that don't always fit the mold of our traditional functions. We forget that when God's at work, we may have to live a little differently, to work with Jesus to reveal God's power, to point others to God's abundance, even when things seem slim. And what I love most about this passage is that it reminds us but sometimes it's the very youngest among us heeding calls from Jesus that we adults don't. Children don't get a lot of lead parts in the Bible. So when they do, something important to make, enough, to make an appearance in the text, I think it's worth reading really carefully. Especially since Jesus took children and their faith very seriously. Their faith is so different from our own, sometimes jaded, adult faith. Andrew seems to have asked many in attendance whether or not they have any food to share. We read in Mark's account that Jesus sent them to do just that. And Andrew has found one little boy who brought his small lunch of five loaves of barley bread and two fish. And you can imagine being in that crowd at the end of the day, having a disciple come and ask you whether you have food or not. And you might think to yourself, well, yeah, I mean, I grabbed my lunch today, but I don't really have that much to give, so I'm just not going to say anything. Or you might assume the worst of the disciples, that they're just begging for themselves and they're going to take your food. So it isn't surprising that the disciples didn't come back to Jesus with baskets and baskets full of food from everyone being generous and sharing. What's really surprising is that anyone, let alone a little boy, would give up what little they had so the disciples couldn't come back with anything to give Jesus. 
And Jesus was excited about this offering from this little boy. Unlike the disciples who were wondering what on earth we could do with this little bit of food for all of these people. Jesus, though, seems really hopeful. He has something to work with. So he goes about blessing the small meal, starts to distribute the bread and fish to everyone, then he tells the disciples to go and get the leftovers. Jesus had received from a little boy so much trust that as that little boy handed over his lunch, Jesus took it and in faith believed with God that a miracle would occur. And he handed out the food. And we know this story of a miracle. It's, it's one that, that we have read over and over. It lands in the lectionary multiple times because it's in every gospel. We know that at the end there were abundant leftovers. What we don't know, and the Bible never tells us, is exactly how it happened. I mean, perhaps the food literally multiplied in the baskets. I've seen this in, in biblical movies sometimes. Or perhaps, for the sake of a thought exercise, there could be another explanation. Or maybe at least one that speaks to us in new ways today. Perhaps this miracle was the Galilean equivalent of stone soup. Have you ever heard the tale of stone soup? I heard Jim Somerville, who's the pastor of First Baptist of Richmond, tell this story in relationship to this text, and I, I just had to share it with you. So here's the story. A young man is walking down the road. He walked all night and all day. He was tired and he was hungry. He came upon a fine house where he was pretty sure he could get a decent meal. But just to be sure, he picked up a smooth round stone and dropped it into his bag. And he knocked on the door. An old woman opened the door just a crack and said, what do you want? He said, please, could you give me something to eat? I'm tired and I'm hungry. And then she said, there's nothing to eat here. Slam the door in his face. But he knocks again. Excuse me, he said. If you can't give me something to eat, perhaps you could give me a pot so I could make some stone soup. And the old woman says, stone soup, what's that? So he takes the stone out of his pouch and he holds it up and he says, soup from a stone. And she said, well, imagine that. So she invited him in, put a big pot on the stove, filled it with water. They turned on the fire underneath, and he dropped the stone into the pot. And for a while, they just stood there, looking into the pot, waiting for the water to boil. When it did, he took a spoon and tasted some of the water. Hmm, he said, that's good. But you know, every soup needs a little salt and pepper. And she said, well, you know, I, I think I have a little salt and pepper here. Just a minute. So she brings it out of the cupboard. They shake it into the pot. And a little while later, he tastes it again. He said, oh, that's, that's better. But you know what would make it even better? Some carrots, some potatoes. And the old woman said, you know, I might just have some carrots and potatoes around here. Sure enough, she did. So they cut them up and they put them in the pot. A little later, he tasted it again. He said, it's good, but you know, it would be so much better with a nice juicy beef bone. She said, well, you know, I might just have a nice juicy beef bone. And they found it and they put it in the pot. They added more and more ingredients, cabbage, barley, milk. They stirred that soup until it began to smell delicious. And finally, he said, I think it's ready. And so she puts two bowls on the table, napkins, silverware, glasses of cold milk. They sat down together, and they ate that soup. And it was the best soup she had ever tasted. When he was finished, she said, would you like to stay the night? He said that he would. 
And the next day, she made him a big breakfast and sent him on his way. As he walked down the road, she watched him disappear into the distance and said, soup from a stone, imagine that. I wonder with Jim if perhaps that might just be what happened the day Jesus managed to feed 5,000 people with just a couple loaves of bread and two fish. As Jesus prayed his prayer to multiply that small meal, did people begin to draw from under their cloaks the food they had brought? Was it only this boy who had brought lunch? Or was it only this boy who was willing to share? Did this little boy's radical act of trust handing over his lunch, coupled with Jesus' radical act of faith, inspire a different kind of miracle? A miracle where people added what they had to what the boy had given until everyone had enough to eat and 12 baskets were left over. Jim says it's kind of like a potluck dinner for Baptists where everyone frets there's not going to be enough food. For Then each person makes entirely too much food and by the end we could feed an army three times over. <laughs> now, I know this isn't the traditional interpretation of the story and I'm not going to speculate as to how the miracle actually happened. The Bible just doesn't tell us. But what is meaningful about this way of looking at the story is it this kind of miracle, the one we read about in Stone Soup? It's no less miraculous than that traditional kind of miracle of multiplication that we read in this story before. In fact, it might even be more of a miracle. Because you see, it, it is always God's heart to provide food and bread for us. But people, people are often too self-focused we're too busy taking care of number one to sacrificially give up our hard-earned bread for others. In fact, it would take a pretty big miracle for our greedy, grasping hands to let go of what little we have and place it into the miracle-working hands of Jesus. And this is just the kind of miracle I think the world needs. It's not that God doesn't want humanity to survive and thrive, to have enough to eat. It's that far too many of us are unwilling to share, unwilling to be a part of God's miracle on earth, to care for those who are struggling. And God's not coercing us. God's not twisting our arm to participate in these miracles. God made us free to decide whether to contribute to God's kingdom come to earth. We can be everyone else or we can be the little boy. The miracle we're looking for today may or may not happen in the way we've traditionally read this text, but it still can happen if we are willing to let go of our stinginess, to radically trust Jesus with all we have. If a little boy with five loaves and two fishes can do it, I think we seasoned adults have what it takes too. And when we do, God will do the work of multiplying all we have to give. Our gifts of money, of donated items, of hours of service, they will pay off and multiplied dividends for the kingdom that inspire the world and demonstrate what Jesus had in mind about this kingdom of God, this dream of God that he was always preaching about. The real miracle isn't always what we expect, is it? Sometimes it's a little boy willing to offer his lunch. Sometimes it's an inspiration to step out and trust when it doesn't seem to make sense to do so. I can say I, I've never considered stepping out of a boat onto the sea like is recorded in the second half of our text. And I've certainly never seen someone walking on waves. But what I can imagine is that Jesus the Christ, 
the one who inspired a little boy to bring his lunch and created a miracle of massive proportions, still inspires those of us who are his followers to step out in faith. Even when things look bleak, to give all and risk all, trusting that he means what he says, when he says, don't be afraid. I think our prayer should be, God, take my fears. My fears of not having enough. My fears of doing something radically trusted in someone besides myself. My fears of giving up too much of myself. Take my worry, God. Turn it into a trust that multiplies many times over. I put not only my offering, like the little boy's lunch, but my whole life into your hands, and I'm ready to see what you can do with it. I believe that these moments of reflection and prayer and surrendering our own worries will prepare us for the next stages of our shared faith, too. I mean, this is why we're heading into a season of discernment together soon. It's why we are listening to God for First Baptist's next steps alongside our sister church, Chatham Heights Baptist, in our reshape process. As we do that, I believe that we can take our little and release it to God, to put it in the hands of Jesus, like that little boy put his lunch into Jesus' hands. And we will see a lot come of it. If we'll just let go. As we sing our final hymn, we have an opportunity to listen, to respond to God. If there's any decision you would like to make, whether to be following Jesus, joining with this faith community to do good work, or just to pray, you are welcome here. I will be down front. Our final hymn for the day is on page 568. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Would you stand with me, please? now the benediction. 
May God take away your fears. May Christ take what, what's ever in your basket and multiply it. And may the Holy Spirit inspire us to all join together in trust and in faith today and always. Thank you.